So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our side event on how the treatment and recovery narrative causes harm in human rights violations. Uh, I'm refreshed. It certainly seems like it's your first side event, not your hundredth, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Randy Thompson from Help Not Handcuffs. Um, our group advocates for human rights recovery and drug drug policy reform, and we don't substitute one for the other. We don't think that recovery should dominate over human rights. Um, some quick background, we have been trying to highlight on how this narrative actually causes harm to our population from a recovery perspective. Um, not just on creating stereotypes and falsehoods and forcing the population into the criminal justice system, but also uh, on quite an occasion, a lot of egregious human rights violations. So we've been persisting with that dialogue, as have many other groups, but we highlight it from the recovery perspective. And what we want to do with this side event is bring in some people who can go much deeper on that issue, some experts. So I'm really happy to be here today with Dr. Stan Peel, who is a, a well-renowned expert and uh, author of over a dozen books on the topics of recovery, harm reduction, and uh, addiction. And we also have Dr. Gomez with us, who is hails from the Wayne Institute and uh, the Fried Institute as well. And he's going to talk about institutional betrayal. So uh, without that, I'm just going to give you some housekeeping information. We are going to show at some point an explicit clip. Um, it is about um, an institutional sexual assault uh, by law enforcement officers. We'll let you know when the clip is coming up. It has been shown on national television, but we just wanted to prompt you on that, let you know that that's going to take place. We really hope that this presentation continues the dialogue and is of use to you as NGOs and member states as we go forward with the process towards 2019 and implementing the UNGAS outcome document, as well as the sustainable development goals, particularly uh, SDG number three for health and well-being, SDG 10 for inequalities, and SDG 16 for accountable and transparent institutions. So with that, we're gonna get started. And Stan, if you'd like to lead off. Okay. We're proposing to radically rethink the whole relationship between society and drugs, and in particular how the United Nations and the United States as a country thinks about and approaches the drug question. So here's our plan for this little presentation. Um, we're going to talk about how most drug use is normal barring social and psychological trauma, that the vast majority of addicted people recover without treatment, that social institutions both create and punish negative drug use, <laughs> that drug use is common, but minority drug users are penalized the most for drugs. We're going to then highlight social police and treatment institutions and their harm with drug users. And where we're not... Uh, we draw a parallel between the underlying thinking of police approaches to addiction and standard treatment approaches to addiction. We think they're coming out of the same box. And then we call on the United Nations, Randy description, to highlight the human rights for drug users as a discriminatory minority. So I just, I'd like to start out with a few challenging questions. Is a former heroin addict who uses heroin again, can he still be in recovery? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. We got a group that's already probably a little aware of, of where we're headed here. Can a formerly alcohol dependent person use alcohol subsequently without problems? What does sober mean? That's a term that is thrown around throughout this conference. Oh, Miss, the lady with the glasses there. What's sober mean? I'm sorry, what's that? It's name, uh, it would mean for me that you're not a drug user anymore. I would be my interpretation. So you would say, hey, abstinence. Yeah. Okay, and now the, the term sober in English means not being intoxicated, but it's been taken over to mean abstinence. And a further movement could be functionality. A person might be called sober if they had gone from being dysfunctional around drugs and alcohol to being functional around it. Um, 
Um, these are some farther out questions we're not going to really get into. How are wet houses uh, where street alcoholics live and are allowed to drink and heroin maintenance sites, which are present in Europe, in Germany I know, where, her, where heroin is provided to users or where they bring it to heroin and use it, how's that related to sobriety? And then a challenging question is how medicine assisted treatment, which is quite the range now in the United States and elsewhere in terms of harm reduction, but it's also really a disease approach. And so I'm not going to get into all of this, but <clears throat> is MAT substitution of a narcotic a solution to addiction, a variation on addiction, a necessity for addicted people? The, the methadone people say you're born with a metabolic dysfunction, you have to take some kind of narcotic or a transition for addicted people. That's a big, those are big questions that we're really not going to have a chance to get into. <laughs> And these sorts are massive. America loves to do giant studies. <clears throat> they survey 42,000 people. And these are the lifetime recovery rates for nicotine, alcohol, cannabis, and cocaine. Mostly without, more without treatment. And the number afterwards is, the quick answers the question, by what point do half of the people who've been dependent on the substance recover? 50%. As you can see, nicotine's the toughest addiction to quit by that rank. It takes 26 years for 50% of people who've been dependent on nicotine to quit. Illicit drugs are pretty low on that totem pole. People who are dependent on the cannabis and cocaine, you look puzzled. What do you think? Why? I'm just thinking. Do you carry on? What's that? I said, you just carry on. I'm just thinking. I wasn't there. Uh, the puzzled look was just my Why mind. is cocaine, why does it take quicker to recover from cocaine dependence than alcohol dependence? Come on, you have to have an answer. We're, you ought to come up with an answer. Um, we're going to kick you out. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I really don't know. I don't, I don't know if I fully understand the word recovery or if I would use it People myself. used to be dependent on those substances. By DSM-4, they are no longer dependent on them. More restrictive? What's that? Access. More restrictive. What's that? Access. It's, it's hard to be a cocaine, it's harder to be a cocaine addict than an alcoholic. You have to deal with, you have to get illegal drugs, you have to live outside the lifestyle of most average people. And of course, cigarettes are the easiest addiction to have. But of course, once you start thinking that way, you start saying, you mean people are more likely to give up an addiction the more difficult it is to integrate in their lives. That's a different way of thinking about drugs and addiction, isn't it? It's saying, well, people are kind of balancing life choices. And really, the whole approach that's taken at the UN and by the disease model says that's impossible. That's not how people work. They become addicted and they can't escape. So you see we're going in, in a different direction, and the only difference between our direction and the disease direction is ours is based on actual information and theirs is based on a 19th century fantasy, which happens to be currently perpetuated. Um, now what about heroin? After Vietnam, 93% of addicted vets recovered. Lee Robbins was the person who studied that. And she said, is it, you know, when you come back from Vietnam and you quit a heroin addiction, well, you've left the war zone. But then she argued that that's really, the data show that that's the standard approach. Most people quit heroin addictions. Heroin addictions are hard. She concluded, based on numerous studies, recovery from heroin addiction is a general rule and not an exception that cropped up in Vietnam. So every single thing that's based on actual information contradicts everything that's said at this conference. Not everything, but the entire approach of the UN and the United States and the disease model and the police model. That National Epidemiological Survey, well, that's NISARC. 
only out, you know, the, the number of people who are alcohol dependent is overwhelmingly greater than the number of people who are drug dependent. Only 12% receive actual treatment for their alcohol dependence in these sort. You saw that 84% recovered. More than half of the formerly dependent drinkers still drink. So they don't meet your definition of recovery. So you, you think they should stop doing this survey, NISARC survey? You think they're doing the wrong thing? They're using clinical categories where they look at a person's functionality. And people who are formerly alcohol dependent are no longer dependent in terms of that measurement. So you, you think the government should stop funding that survey because of their bad thinking or? It's fine. I'm just, I'm coming from a medical work also and I, I uh, have experience with people who became alcoholic and they became completely sick of it. So I'm nervous of the whole survey. So what do you think about this all this data they're accumulating? You're going, to, you're going to go home and forget it, right? It's okay. Nobody likes to look at these data because all of these data undercut the way that we think about addiction. Why don't we know about people overcoming addiction? Drew Barrymore was America's youngest addict. She was a cover of People magazine at age 14. She wrote Little Girl Lost at age 16. In her 30s, she started a winery. And she confessed, I'm not sober. She's using your definition. Well, wouldn't it be more interesting to write how to overcome a childhood addiction? Wouldn't that be interesting to know from her? How she was America's youngest addict and now she's like a big star and has a winery? <clears throat> One last thing. Uh, there's a new article in Reason We're, we're undergoing an opioid craze. There's another survey. They do these crazy surveys in America. In 2015, 98 million Americans took an opioid painkiller. Licitly or illicitly. Between 1 and 2% developed any kind of a problem. Yet emergency department overdose visits rose 30% in 2017. We don't have an opioid crisis in America. We don't have an opioid addiction crisis. We have an opioid death crisis. Opioids themselves are, and addiction is not the problem. The way that we're using opioids is somehow astronomically increasing the number of people who are dying from using drugs. Is it time for Randy now? OK, why do some people use drugs better? Most drug users are intelligent, resourceful people with good life skills. I'm going to jump to the next paragraph. The atypical experience of the relatively small number of drug users from stable backgrounds who stumble into addiction. Who wrote that? Professor Paul Hayes. He was the CEO of the National Treatment Agency for Substance, for substance Misuse in Britain. So here's a man whose job it was to treat addiction who's saying something fundamentally different from everything that we think about drugs, which is what we need to prevent people from taking drugs in the first place. He's saying it's the person and their life space that determines the reaction to the drugs. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I mean, really questioning the, the dominant paradigm right here. And then I just want to pick up from where Stanton's leaving off and start talking about, you know, the visceral language that's used. You know, why do we do the things we do? We have to ramp up the drug war. We have to be harsher. Our uh, President Trump is calling to kill drug dealers now. And it's because, you know, we value life. We want to attack addiction. We want to protect people from these horrible negative life events. But when we take a look at what's really killing most people, we take an epidemiological viewpoint. You see that 610,000 people, this is in America, died from heart disease, 480,000 from cigarettes, 300 some odd thousand from diabetes. And you know what? These are comparable health issues, not because they're exactly the same, but our own medical research institutions compare them regularly because these take behavioral changes, lifestyle changes to manage these. 
You have to change what you eat. You have to change your diet. You have to change your lifestyle. You have to listen to the doctor. So they compare them regularly. And you know what? When we compare them to drug use, what do we say? Listen, that's not an insignificant number. 64,000 people dying from drug use. That is a tragedy in and of itself. But it is well out of proportion, like Stanton was saying, that they take that, that negative narrative and that floats to the top like cream for some reason, and that's what everybody hears. When really, that is not our major problem. We need to work on it, but that is not the major problem. Uh, so when that narrative you know, uh, kind of actualizes into our public policies, it impacts everything, not just the stereotypes, not just how people are viewed, but also resource allocation, and it creates an imbalance that's severe in the institutional landscape. So if you try to think of I'm trying to make pillars, and people have used the term pillars before, for a population to balance itself and stand on. And this is just one snippet we're taking right here of syringe access programs in one state. Now, New Jersey is a state with 9 million people, 565 municipalities, and 21 counties, and there are six syringe access programs in the entire state, one for the entire southern portion of the state. Um, that's when we have a quote unquote heroin epidemic. Injection drug use has increased 31%, and they're chronically underfunded as well. Now, we could take an entire day and talk about resource allocation, but I just wanted to show this as a, a highlight as to how, how severe the imbalance is. But meanwhile, we invest heavily in treatment. We invest heavily in the criminal justice system. And again, going back to that, those pillars, and again, that's not an original term, but if you're trying to balance yourself on that, and one's way up here and one's down here, you're going to topple right over. And that's what we have, is people toppling right over because of the decisions that are made based on the stereotype that Stanton was just talking about. So here we go. Here's what we've invested in. National statistics in the US. 1.5 million people are arrested for drug possession. I'm sure you've heard these numbers before, but I just want to do due diligence. 84% of them are petty possession. These are not big possession people. Drug arrests are historically racially disparate. We've known this for almost a quarter century. So think of SDG 10, where you're talking about resolving inequalities within countries. Uh, this mass population is forced into the criminal justice system, not because they're hurting someone, not because they're stealing something, but just because of this decision at a policy level. But the question we should be honest and address is, don't some people commit crime? Yes. They use drugs. And I had to go back down to the state level data. Sorry to jump from national state, national state, but this is what I could get for you to show you an example. In New Jersey, homicides, assault, sexual assault, robbery, the whole litany of crimes that are driven by drugs, they call it drug attribution crimes, comes out to about 11,000 crimes. Not a small amount, right? Um, but now you compare that to the non-drug using population where you have the majority of crimes. So that's not the real takeaway though. This becomes small compared to that, but when you look at what <coughs> people are getting arrested for, it's drug laws. 45,000 versus 11,000. Four to five drug arrests are not because they committed any crime, it's because of the policy. So it's, you know, the, the whole stereotype again about using drugs, getting addicted, having to steal something or rob, continue addiction, it's not showing up in the facts that we see. And then talking about what arrest and coercion really is, it's really systematic violence. Uh, the WHO's definition of violence supports that. It causes intentional harm, and it exposes the individual to extreme amounts of risk. With due diligence, you know, everybody knows this, but when you get arrested, you're facing criminal record. It can be a barrier to employment, housing, education, social services, incarceration. If you get incarcerated for it, forget about it. Your community connections are now threatened. Um, your housing could be lost, uh, you know, fines and a loss of license. And that's just what we've legislated. That's what we say we want to happen. The risks from interacting with certain institutions like police become severe. Now, the statistics are non-drug specific. I'm not going to read them off in the interest of time. But I just want you to keep in your mind the risks that people face when we force them into the criminal justice system, and we'll get to other institutions in a minute. Arrest-related death, meaning dying, losing your life during the process of arrest. Police brutality, death, sexual victimization, and assault in jail. Um, and just to talk, touch about these numbers, um, sexual victimization in jail, this is not all prisons, but that middle number, you actually have more people being sexually victimized by the correctional staff than you do by other inmates. So, I mean, talk about, you know, when we have, uh, you know, policies that say, 
the cops are going to be the warm receivers of people who have problems. We have to be honest and talk about these realities. This is a hyper vulnerable population that is very stigmatized. Um, and then treatment. We, we can't just put people in treatment and force them in there, coerce them in there, and think that nothing bad is going to happen. You have run the risk of death, sexual victimization, assault, exploitation. In New Jersey, drug overdose is the third leading cause of death. So forcing someone to treatment could be a de facto death sentence. In fact, 124 people have died in the New Jersey drug court program in five years. But when drug court speaks publicly, they talk about the stereotype. They say this person got addicted, they uh, you know, were arrested, had to enter the criminal justice system, and now here they are at the graduation ceremony saying, thank God I was arrested, thank God for drug court. Those are the people that make it. Those are the people that sometimes don't even need to be in the program, but they graduate out. And we never hear about the people that don't make it or the ones that die. Uh, this is that video I told you about. So this is graphic. I'm going to read off the captions to you. Oh, it's not playing. Anyway, could you maybe press play on the... Is, should be a play button. There we go. Uh, two women pulled over, speeding, officers found a small amount of marijuana. They were in the car, doing something they had no business, and you claim you found the butt end of what they were doing? Why do you need to do that research? Hamilton was searched first, and listen to her reaction. She realizes He's what's about to happen. About Are you serious? Can you get in there? We're going to You better go up my private part. Okay? The women say the trooper never changed gloves between the searches. Nothing was found on either woman. The female trooper from that day was fired. The male trooper suspended. The thing that's offensive about this is the fact that it's it's an the most intrusive type of search, which is a body cavity search. And the question is, for what? Both officers dismissed following assault, but one was rehired because... It was believed she was following orders to sexually assault that woman. Another woman, a 21-year-old college student, pulled over for failure. Hands are already handcuffed behind me. You know, so she pulls my pants down. And then she tells me to bend over. So, you know, I kind of hesitated because I'm like, bend over. And, um, and I just, I bent over. And she proceeded to stick her fingers in me. And I popped up immediately and I told her, no, what are you doing? You can't do that to me portion where they pretextually sexually assaulted this young woman because they thought she was where it all comes home. Grand jury failed to indict the officers. There was no wrongdoing. And in fact, in 2015, a bill had to be introduced saying, you can't do a warrantless cavity search for drugs. As if a judge signing off on something like that, on sexually assaulting someone, makes it acceptable. These are the violent risks we were talking about. We wanted to illuminate these are real people, not just data. Um, I live in Asbury Park. It's right next to Neptune Township. Katie Lee Thomas. A uh, young single mother, 21 years old, up visiting from North Carolina. She was arrested for a drug pipe. She died a couple hours later in police custody. Um, what's interesting is, and Jennifer's going to talk more about this, is it's a troubled institution. The year before Katie Lee Thomas died, and we still don't know why she died in custody, one of the lieutenants who had had a dozen domestic violence calls to his home went on a daytime rampage and murdered his wife. Um, shortly after, that was Tamara Seidel, who was murdered by her husband, the lieutenant. Then Katie Lee Thomas dies. Then two female police officers resigned publicly because they were being sexually harassed by their own administration and their own fellow officers. They went to court and they won. 
they came back to work, and the sexual harassment increased to the point where they had to resign publicly. So this is this is what we're talking about. There's danger if the, these institutions are 100% healthy, and then you have chronically troubled institutions that we're forcing this population into. There's another woman, we removed her picture, 18-year-old uh, woman was arrested for drug possession, along with a couple of her uh, male friends. The officers separated them immediately, took off the 18-year-old woman, uh, raped her. They're now uh, facing prison, but that was the pretext to gain, to seize her body and remove her from the street. So with that, I, we go over to Jennifer on the institutional betrayal piece. Thank you, Randy. I'll have you be in charge of the paper. Oh, so I don't so. mess anything up. Um, as uh, Randy mentioned at the beginning, I'm here, of course, with Health Not Handcuffs, and I'm a researcher and clinical psychologist at Penn State University in the U.S. Um, what Randy has so poignantly described to us so far um, is the harm that institutions like police can do to people who are using drugs. So what I want to do just briefly is to introduce a research concept called institutional betrayal that really help us understand, um, as if we need any more information from what he just showed us, all the ways in which this can be harmful for individuals. So institutional betrayal was um, developed and created by American psychologists and researchers, Dr. Carly Smith and Dr. Jennifer Fry. And what they did here was really um, found a way to implicate institutions in harm. So it's not just that institutions have policies that aren't nice. Um, it's that actually, when we see, if we take any harm, Let's say a rape. Um, if an institution like police reacts, behaves, responds poorly, then the mental health outcomes that are typically associated with something like rape are increased. And the research has shown us that so far. And so for the next slide, Randy. Looking at what is institutional betrayal, you can see it here along two dimensions, and I'll go ahead and walk you through it. So along this um, horizontal axis is apparently isolated to apparently systemic. So apparently isolated is there was that one cop that one time who killed that one person. They're a bad apple. That's apparently isolated. Apparently systemic would be, oh, actually, this police department has a pretty good history of police violence, including murder. Um, and we see this happening um, as even part of the fabric of how this police department operates that's then apparently systemic. If we look here vertically, we have commission and omission. So commission is when an institution does, right? What they, what they do, their policies, their behavior. Omission is what they don't do. In other words, what they fail to do to protect people. So I'll walk you through these four um, quadrants and how they relate to people who use drugs, potentially. So number one in the upper left-hand corner, apparently isolating commission. That's something that Randy just described. There's a police officer who physically or sexually assaults a person in their custody for using drugs, allegedly for using drugs, but apparently isolated by commission. If we look here, lower left, apparently isolated by omission. So this could be a mental health care facility that when a patient complains that they were coerced into treatment, they're forced to take medication like antipsychotics, which have pretty heavy side effects. Um, when their privacy is violated, confidentiality is violated, they go to complain to the organization and the mental health care facility does nothing. That's institutional betrayal, again, by omission. If we go here to the upper right, apparently systemic by commission, this could be a criminal justice system that through criminalizing drug use then systematically incarcerates individuals. And as Randy mentioned earlier, this taking away, of course, their civil liberties, their freedom, their rights <coughs> in the time that they are in prison. Uh, but also in the U.S., if we, it's very difficult to reintegrate to society, to become employed, to vote for people in office who make these laws, and so on. And then lastly, in the lower right-hand corner, apparently systemic by omission. So we can take an example here for people who engage in problematic drug use. We know that those are the minority of people who have problems with drug use, but there's still enough, right? And so, um, apparently systemic by omission, institutional betrayal could be not offering a range of options like harm reduction, <coughs> drug quality control, and quality mental health care. For mental health care, this could include 
having um, therapy for drug use that did not incorporate the impact of poverty, discrimination, violence exposure, all these things that we know are linked with problematic drug use and research. Can you go to the next slide, Randy? So theoretical and empirical research out of the US has shown that many institutions um, are capable, and sometimes we have evidence they actually do commit these institutional betrayals. And remember, this is not benign, right? These actual institutional betrayals are linked with even worse mental health problems on individuals. Before, on the bottom of the list, that meant most of us people who use drugs, the mental health care system, the criminal justice system, government, um, and then, of course, police. I want to close before we kick it back over to Stanton that nascent research now on institutional betrayal is showing that minorities are reporting higher instances of institutional betrayal, 60%, um, compared to our more normative samples, mainstream samples that are reporting 40. So minorities reporting 60%. What this indicates to us is that of so many societal injustices, the disproportionate harm of institutional betrayal falls on people who are already marginalized in society. And with that, I'll take it over to Stan. So where do we want to go with all this? What kind of a model are we talking about? <clears throat> we are talking about human rights for drug users. Okay by drug users' units. Are you drug users an oppressed minority? Of course, are they a minority if you look at everybody who uses drugs? A better way of putting it, minority people don't use more drugs, but they're more disadvantaged in their use, both in terms of how they use, because they have fewer resources to maintain their lives, and as has just been detailed by Jennifer, uh, and Randy, they had to suffer many more disadvantages as a result of using drugs. I mean, most middle-class suburban drug users aren't going to be hand-searched. Let's ask a more basic question. Why are drug users arrested, imprisoned, and treated? On what basis have we come to that approach? Is it because their behavior is unhealthy? Well, then are we going to arrest fat people and smokers? Is it because they're addicted? Uh, the World Health Organization has just declared gaming addiction to be a, a, a disorder. It, so they're going to have, you know, the, the, this organization is the United Nations for drugs and crime, they're going to have to change that to the United Nations Agency for Gaming and Crime. <laughs> well, what about the United States Agency for Sex and Crime? Are, are there sex addicts? If we're basing that decision on addiction by the official recognition of comparable bodies, we can't just have drugs and crime. Um, the rights of drug users is normal users. Addiction.com is a website and they commissioned a survey of regular drug users. 29 million Americans use drugs. That's about 10%, more than 10% of Americans. But they got, they hired some research guys. You know those nerdy guys who just look at the data? And the headline was, we found that most drug addicts, which is addicts is a funny word, that's their word, are pretty similar to everyday people. Damn it. <laughs> these habits don't seem to fit the stereotypes we typically associate with these drugs. Most of these people have jobs, wake up at a normal time, and eat breakfast. <laughs> uh, eating breakfast. Can you? So then the question, how do we have a United... I sat in the thing before us here. They want a drug for society. How do, how do we regulate all of these people who are otherwise normal except for the fact that they use drugs? What do we, it's simplification to say, well, they're normal drug users and they're addicted drug users. But how are we in charge of addicted drug users? Remember, most of them outgrow their addiction. Those who don't are characterized by disadvantages. 
So how is the World Health Organization, how is the United Nations arresting and treating, remember that was the question, people who suffer from these kinds of going in factors that make it more likely that they have disadvantaged drug use? Why are they going to be the ones who are arrested and treated for drugs so much more than anybody else? And then how are they going to address these problems? Human, human rights and the drug user. So we're witnessing worse drug user victimization than ever before. By the way, the World Health Organization in the United Nations have been working over drugs for a long time. Perhaps you're aware that uh, from 2000 to 2017, drug deaths in America increased 350%. And over the last year, 2017, hospitalizations increased 38% since 2016. We can't cap it. We can't ever put a lid on it. And yet, we're redoubling the very efforts that have brought us to this point. They're proud of it. When I came in this morning, they had cartoons by uh, graphic artists about the drug problem. And I went and looked at one, and there was a guy in a bottle, except they had pills in the bottle, and I said to the guy, you know, this picture could be a hundred years old, and you know, if I come back in a hundred years, I hope you're still here, I said to him, um, you can have the same picture of a bottle, and this is where I sometimes get in trouble, I started going, help, let me out of my bottle, and everybody started looking at me, but then I, I, I wasn't picked up. Here's our Declaration of Drug Users' Bill of Rights. And we expect the whole United Nations Convention to vote on it, and I hope you'll vote in our favor. Every human being has a right to consume whatever substances he or she wishes. I don't know. How are you going to stop people from doing that? If they can smoke and drink alcohol, if they can get a prescription for opioids, why shouldn't everybody have that right? With full information and support from the government. What do I mean by support from the government? We know how to stop drug deaths. We've proven we can do it. There has never been a drug death at a drug consumption site where people come in and consume their drugs with medical personnel and where the drugs are tested. We can stop drug deaths. There is not one drug consumption site in the United States of America. Not one. We can stop that. We can give people information. Of course, we should tell people, don't take opioids and tranquilizers at the same time. Of course, we should help them get pure drugs. If they're getting heroin mixed with fentanyl, that 100 time increases the likelihood of death. And then we can provide assistance as needed when problems develop. Because people get the problems all kinds of things, and we should help them with care. What now? This is our last slide. Yeah, and this is kicking over Randy. Oh, this is Randy? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> CEO, well, we'll we'll let you do it. Sure. So, I mean, really, it was a plea. And again, you know, many groups are making this plea. We just wanted to make it known that groups that support recovery are not, you know, kind of pigeonholed, that we support this, and there are people who go from drug use, whether it's recreational or problematic, and make a decision to stop using drugs in their lives, certainly support these types of reforms. Uh, so recognize the changing realities of drug use, clearly separating the criminal justice system from drug policy, and that means removing coercion, too. You don't want to slide into, okay, you're not going to get arrested, but now you got to go to treatment, and that just starts the whole ball of coercion again. And then incorporating the links between drug policy reform and the SDGs, we see that as very clear even beyond the ones that I mentioned, because healthy communities, <coughs> certainly in universities and stress on the individual, and why people may slide into some problematic use to begin with. And then correcting the harms from drug policies, boosting the treatment, and then we would love to see you know, a drug use of rights uh, resolution passed. You know, that's, that, that may be a little ways off, but we would certainly support that. So with that, I want to open it up to questions. Anybody? Ask anyone on the panel anything? Yeah, so we have a full 10 minutes because we actually stayed on time to be able to uh, well ask questions and discuss. Okay, 
Um, I'm from the International Network of People Who Use Drugs, and we also question and challenge the disease model because we believe it, it's pathologizing and renders people who use drugs as helpless. Um, we agree moving beyond it to look at social structural factors. Um, but I'm just, I find the presentation, the presentations are quite confusing because there's a lot of focus on recovery language, but on the other hand, you're talking about the right of people who use drugs to use drugs. So I'm just, like, you using the recovery language seems to imply language. that, you know, if you do use drugs, then your, your life is not as of value as people that are recovered. So that dichotomy. Clear up, and I apologize, that's not clear because uh, health not handcuffs, these people in recovery, that small portion of people that had problematic drug use that decided to make a change, uh, certainly as uh, equal, and people actively use drugs as equal. They're the same population. There's no harm that was ever done to me in recovery that wasn't intentionally done to me when I was actively using drugs. You know, the barriers that are in front of my life now were done because I was actively using drugs and they were criminalized. It's the same population, and certainly, I always say that the recovery community has a lot to offer, and where we need to be real quiet and not speak is on how to effectively use drugs because we're those few people who really didn't uh, you know, know how to do it effectively. Plenty of people use drugs, it's a reality, and they do so with healthy, productive lives and are valued members of the community. But I just want to make that clear for the organization's position. And thank you for the work that you do. I know you do good work. Anybody else have any ideas or questions? Sure. Uh, colleague was on the previous side the event. It is really sad to hear how America works. Previously, uh, was a gentleman from Norwegian police uh, talking about how Norwegian police works. You know, they are unarmed. Their main goal is prevention. They speak to people if somebody needs help. They connect them with the social. Uh, and it, it's really sad what, what what you presented and how the things in, in, in U.S. work. Well, I was going to ask that policeman a question, which was, was he aware of the D.A.R.E. program, which was another drug abstinence program run by the police, and any evaluations of it? And I said, it's my impression that none ever found it to be effective, and some found it to be counterproductive. So it's good that the police are talking to people. But are they the people we really need to be talking to people about drugs? Are they the right best examples? Um, how did they decide, how, who came up with the idea that the police should be the best interveners in communities around those kinds of social issues? So I feel like a very nice man. I must be rather be arrested by him. <laughs> <laughs> some of the cops in Philadelphia where I grew up, but still, is that the right institution for that process? And it might be if I can add to that um, cultural differences here. So in the U.S., we're told that the police are there to protect and serve. That's the mantra. Um, a lot of our interactions, primary and vicarious, are not that. And so if you actually had a police system that was there to protect and serve in these ways, that would look very different than how we in the U.S. think of police. We don't see them as people to go to um, when we need help. And so I think that um, my perspective, um, you know, to respect to Sam's, is that there's, the problem is big enough um, that anyone who's trying to help um, and doing so in a nonviolent way that respects the autonomy of individuals seems really positive. Maybe the police system. Um, when I talk to my more radical colleagues, they say, "Get rid of it all, <laughs> you know, the police in the U.S., and then just start over um, with how we can be doing this better." Well, I'm for police okay. arresting people for violent crimes. I'm not a eliminate the police person, but I don't think they should be a, a primary source of drug education. I was just saying, um, I, my name is Florian and I'm with Youth Rights and one of our strategic priorities is law enforcement and youth because we have this situation, particularly for example in Ireland, where in, the Department of Justice has the drugs portfolio and it loves to get rid of it, but the Department of Health doesn't want to take it. 
and you have members of the force who do want to change things. So how do you, while you still live in a criminalized world, what sort of wiggle room can they use? And the power of discretion, for example, is a, per, is a lovely power that they could be using much more liberally. What we're really, I think, saying is, and addressing inequality, if inequality and prejudice are sources of negative drug use and reactions to drug use, those are the problems that we have to address. We have to make society work in the first place. And foisting off things on either the police on the one hand or in treatment on the other is, is a, a, a band-aid approach to something that we're not fundamentally able to deal with. For example, uh, we in the United States have increasingly devoted money to treatment as opposed to housing and education. And so you ask the question, in the inner city in Baltimore or in rural West Virginia, uh, does it really make sense to take people and put them into addiction treatment when they have generations of poverty or lack of education or housing? So it's the whole addiction paradigm, no matter who it's foisted on, is a stopgap approach to larger questions that we don't seem to be able to really successfully address. And we know we're not successfully addressing them because drug deaths keep increasing in the United States of America. The highest rate of drug deaths in the United States is, occurs in the state of West Virginia, 50 per 100,000 per annum. No other state has as many as 40 per 100,000. Now why is West Virginia, why are people dying? And West Virginia has far from the most uh, opioid prescriptions. It's an impoverished state, which has lost mining resources, which has poor health care. Now those are gigantic questions, but if you don't think about and address those questions, bringing drug treatment or banning prescriptions in West Virginia has no impact whatsoever. We've got two more minutes if someone has a quick question. I want to say something quick because it's definitely a stigma, all the addiction and all this, the disease paradigm, all leads to thinking every drug user is an addict, and the addict is, a, uh, is going to commit a, a crime. And you, you the, the, lad, the one before, had like some, some ideas, but it's, it's hard in this era like to change this paradigm might be difficult, because at the end, if we don't sensitize everyone, not even police officers, that this doesn't work like that, it's just everyday people, even drug users get this stigma, and they're not, they cannot organize. That's why or drug use organizations, I think they're so, so big. So it's meant really like thinking in the future. You know? Like I was in the couch today, you listen to Japan saying that uh, judiciary measures or police measures are not stigmatizing. You know, you see the definition of violence, you do HO, you definitely, it's just, there's some violence there. So how we can come up with a speech or something to really make people understand that this is not the idea to go. It's almost, I don't know, 100 years of this paradigm, 150 years. So how we can go, well, the, the SDGs idea also, I think, but at the end, it's, it comes to the same. For example, Brazil had 30 years of excellent home reduction measures. And there's just right wing and crazy politician came in and just... Well, we want to have, uh, one thing we want to have is to protect the rights of drug users. We want to recognize them, drug users as a group of people if they're a minority or non-minority, is people that have human rights, to look at them as being deserving, respect, and good treatment. Um, and we hope that that would carry over to minority communities as well as majority, where it's less of an issue. We feel that the United Nations has to declare drug users as a protected group. And something I think to add, um, Randy and I were speaking last night about the video he showed. Um, and we were saying, ah, do we show the video, do we not show the video, it's pretty intense. Um, and the decision, if I can speak for Randy, um, even though he's next to me, um, that we made was the importance of humanizing people who are going through this. And I'm a researcher, so a lot of what I look like, what I look at are data and stats, and we can forget very easily that this is a person who could be me, who could be you, who's going through this. If I wouldn't want to go through it, or want my kids to go through it, and how come it's okay for another human to go through it? And so I think changing the dominant paradigm, part of that is changing that if we're talking about people, we're actually talking about people. 
and that people deserve basic civil rights, and that includes everyone, including people who use drugs. Well, I think our, well, I think our time's up now, right? We've been in 50 minutes, and um, we are asking for a fundamentally different way of thinking about drugs and the relationship of drugs and human drug use. And we feel that the entire treatment and legal paradigms are based on a centuries-old model that has proven itself to be ineffective and harmful just by the data that we presented, and that we're asking for a radical reformulation. So going forward, please consider us a resource to work with you in your efforts. I know we, uh, there's several groups working towards that goal. Uh, we certainly support you, and uh, want to thank you all for coming out to our side event. Appreciate thank you. It. No, no, no. Oh. You said the bad are the ones that are stuck, and they're going to get rid of it. Yes. There's a big conversation. You need to move over. So it's a Right. 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 Right.
Yes, I will. We'll see if we can get to it. We will have a Now, the only problem with that, they don't use the word dependent in DSM. In DSM 4, they didn't use the word addictive, they only use the word dependent. In DSM 5, they don't use the word addictive or dependent with any substance. They only use the word addictive. They're against using the word dependent. People get sort of dependent on a lot of drugs, and we don't consider that by itself a problem. Well, you're addicted. You know, make you in a lot of pain. So they don't use dependence either. They think dependence is prejudicial. So when, but, yeah, yeah, don't look at me. But they do use the word addictive in gambling. Say what the Anyway, so I never personally use the word Can our people physically depend on gambling? Are people physically dependent on gaming? I know, saying I'm going to use the book. He hasn't to be our friend. They say, this is a person who's going to be gambling. He doesn't have to be a problem. He doesn't have to be a problem. He doesn't have to be a problem. I don't have any more. Did you call somebody? Well, if right somebody stayed in there and over and not able to they never left their house, they uh, 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 think they were addicted, or was it called physically dependent? What would you use to describe that? Suppose they never left the house.